Hello, Garland Nixon here. Time for our weekly in-depth update on what's happening in West Asia with Latham, Latham Roof. Let's talk. Hello, Garland Nixon here, and uh, I'm hanging out with Leith Maroof again on a Tuesday morning, as usual, one of my most popular guests. People really enjoy this show. I get a lot of great comments about it, so I feel like we're really fortunate to have Leith. He's live in Beirut, Lebanon. He's really at you know ground zero, the center to tell us what's going on there. He's a journalist, and he's doing great work, but uh, we need you to help Lathe. We need you to help the cause. Go to freepalestine.video. That's freepalestine.video. Um, go there. You can see the, the work that Lathe is doing to put forth um, English language information out of uh, the area in real time. Freepalestine.video. And it's, in, it's critical that you donate and help them you know, if you want, there are a lot of people around the world who are, you know, home and they're angry and they're like, I wish I could do something. I wish there's more I can do to help the cause. Well, you can go to freepalestine.video and uh, make sure you, uh, you you give, you know, whatever you can afford. If you don't have any money, if you're like, I got no money to give, go to freepalestine.video, share that website on all your social media uh, platforms and put, in, you know, put a little note, please go here and um donate and that you can so you can help any way you can all right late let's start here a couple of things uh that i think are of, of great we're, we're gonna start we got so much but let's start with this one of the things that you said on our last um our last broadcast was what well, seems now to have been fairly prophetic in a, in a particular way in that you talked about the um uh uh, uh erdogan's party in President Erdogan's party in Turkey taking a beating. And you said, well, it's a number of things, but mostly it is the people are angry over the support for Israel and in particular, the fact that they're supplying, supplying the jet fuel for Israel to bomb the Palestinians. Update me, what's happening in Turkey? Oh, well, we already are seeing uh, the results of this election and uh, the pressure that the public has been putting on Erdogan and his party because they have been the biggest supplier. Of if you could speak a little louder, I'm not. If you could speak a little louder because I'm not hearing you real. The, the volume for some reason is kind of low, but yes. we can hear you. It's just low volume. So is it better right now? Yes, definitely better. Okay, perfect. So uh, what I was saying is that um, uh, you know since the beginning of this war, Erdogan has been using. Uh, public uh, state making public statements in support of the Palestinians but Turkey being the biggest supplier of uh, products including jet fuel that uh, you know is just put into Israeli jets that are bombing Gaza that has never stopped so now we see the results of the election that the main subject that differentiated Erdogan uh, from his opponents was the opponent's position about cutting uh, economic ties with Israel. We see it right now having the results with uh, Turkey uh, seceding um, uh, and putting a ban on the export of 54 products. Uh, that includes uh, metals, uh, raw materials, uh, equipment that could be used in war, and jet fuel. So now, uh, with this happening, we see the first ever actual action, not words, by Turkey in uh, support of the Palestinian people and ending the genocide that we see in Gaza. And this will have immediate effect on the uh, actions of the Israeli uh, Air Force uh, that has been utilized uh, heavily in the bombardment of Gaza and uh, Lebanon and Syria, what have you. So, uh, uh, you know, this uh, right now will have an actual effect on the ground. And thanks to the pressure of the Turkish people and the results of this election that we saw last week, uh, this is happening.
Yeah, I don't hear you, by the way. You're muted, I think. Oh, sorry about that. There's been uh, there's been pushback against the leaders in um, in 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 the region, but now it looks like we're starting to see some results from the pushback from the people. You know, we saw millions of people in the streets in Turkey and other places, and now it looks like it's the pressure is turning up so that it's getting more difficult um, for the regional leaders that are somewhat compromised to hold the line. Um, I understand similar things are going on in Jordan. That Jordan is coming into the state. Oh, yes, yes. You know, in Jordan, there's demonstrations uh, for now two and a half weeks every night uh, after the breaking the fast up till dawn. Uh, and this, uh, you know, is put so much pressure on the Jordanian government. There's been clashes with the demonstrators on a daily basis there. And uh, they had, uh, to, you know, rounded up up to 300 of the demonstrating, um, you know, organizers, uh, people on social media that are uh, famous in Jordan that are pushing for these demonstrations, uh, all to suppress this. And um, now, you know, we put this in the context of the uh, attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus and the pressure that is mounting on Jordan militarily since that moment, because we had the Iraqi resistance uh, saying that they are ready to arm 12,000 uh, Jordanian fighters with uh, you know, light, medium, and heavy equipment uh, to begin a military campaign in support of the Palestinians inside the West Bank uh, from Jordanian territory. We see that uh, Iraqi, Syrian, and Yemeni drones and missiles continue to fly over Jordan to hit targets in the occupied territories. And uh, we also, of course, uh, have seen as a response to these threats coming from the Iraqi resistance um, and the resistance as a whole outside Jordan and inside it, the Jordanians now instituting uh, military checkpoints uh, on all entrances to the major cities in Jordan, as well as uh, you know very uh, in, uh, intermittent uh, checkpoints across all the main highways of Jordan, and they've moved uh, huge amounts of military uh, equipment and personnel to the borders with Iraq. Syria and even Saudi Arabia. So what does this mean? That means that the Jordanian government is uh, very worried about uh, what's happening. They're taking the threat uh, very uh, seriously. And uh, in the uh, situation uh, of the uh, response of uh, Iran coming, which is coming 100%, the response of Iran to the attack on its embassy in Damascus is coming. Uh, uh, and it, it, depending on the response of the Israelis to the response of the Iranians, Jordan may find itself uh, sandwiched between the two warring uh, parties. And, uh, you know, Jordan is a very fragile country that is manufactured by the British, that has been uh, kept in existence through a British and American military alliance. Uh, without uh, the, you know the, the safety net of the Western backing of the king, uh, Jordan would not exist. And this is uh, a moment I think that w we will be seeing as we get closer and closer to the liberation of Palestine, that all these psychic speco borders and the manufactured states in the whole region, not only Israel is manufactured and fabricated and, and cannot be maintained except through force, much of the countries that the West created in, in, in this region cannot exist without the uh, main, you know, continuous military enforcement and physical uh, violence against the people and their will. You know, I recall Donald Trump when he was in, uh, in, in, in uh, the White House saying, and, you know, Do Trump would, uh, one thing about Trump, he would always say things that others wouldn't say. He at one time stated if the U.S. backed away from Saudi Arabia, the, their government would fall in two weeks. So the, 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 the good thing about Donald Trump was he didn't understand imperialism. 
and that you have to keep certain things quiet. And so he would say, hey, we're going to take the oil from Syria. Oh, the Saudi. But the fact of the matter was all of those things that Donald Trump said were 100 percent true, that, uh, as you said, most of these governments will fall. I, it, it, does it appear to you as though um, uh, uh, Egypt is it any because that seems like a, an interesting country, you know, when it politically speaking, it's hard to read. The, the, it seems to me like it's a the military runs it, but the fragility of Egypt and they're caught in a bad spot because they're up to their ears in debt to the West. Your thoughts on on Egypt, how they fit into this puzzle? Oh, yeah. Well, there has been demonstrations in Egypt also for the last week, uh, including the uh, journalist uh, guild and journalist associations had their major demonstrations outside their union house, kind of their, their main office in Cairo, and uh, were chanting in support of the resistance. And, uh, you know, the, the Egyptians are very famous for their comical chants and, and rhymey things that they come up in, in the Arabic world anyways. But part of their chanting was about the uh, guilt and the uh, feelings of humiliation as Egyptians towards what they were seeing happening in Palestine and how, uh, you know, emasculated they feel because of this. So we saw the authorities in, in Egypt arrest some of these journalists after this demonstration. Um, and we've also seen demonstrations by Egyptians making it to the Rafah crossing uh, and uh, chanting uh, for their army to open the doors uh, for aid to come in. Um, and uh, of course, since uh, the uh, 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 killing of the World Central Kitchen uh, aid workers by the Zionists last week and the pressure that mounted in the West, uh, it seems like you know the masters in D.C. in Washington D.C. ordered the Egyptians to increase the aid that's coming through Rafah, and now they increased it to up to 300 trucks coming uh, a, per day from Rafah. None of this aid is reaching it to the north of Gaza, but and and of course 300 uh, trucks a day is not even enough to for the south of Gaza. Uh, but that shows you how much pressure the Egyptian establishment is under and uh, I, I think uh, you know the the, the the strategists that are in the West uh, that are all Zionists that are backing Israel this way are risking all the other vessel states that they control in the region over this tiny uh, you know little uh, fascist uh, uh, you know, colony that they have built. I mean, uh, the United States could probably maintain the looting of the Arabic world and its resources for another hundred years if it gives up, uh, you know, the Zionist colony and actually pretends that it supports Palestinian liberation. But because of this ideological uh, and supremacist, uh, you know, reasons behind why the United States is backing Israel. It's, it's illogical for anybody that uh, analyzes it from just uh, strategic and or geopolitical positionality because they have all the other pieces that they control in the region. So this is why our audience, you know, must understand that at this point, like Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah in his speech uh, last week, uh, last weekend, he said that uh, the elite in the West and the Zionists in Israel have lost their mind. Nothing they are doing makes sense right now because they are, uh, they realize that they've lost the war on October 7th, uh, biggest human uh, defeat for them. And since then, they've lost the war even after six months of genocide in Gaza. They haven't been able to capture anything. Um, and so, so this is the, the, the context of how the West is making its decision. They've lost their mind. You know, you mentioned uh, 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 the fascist uh, uh, f uh, government of, uh, occupy, of occupied Palestine. Uh, I'm going to show you something. Um, I've been showing it to some of my guests recently, getting a comment. Let's take a look at this. This right here 
is the Naval Administration Building right now, not yesterday, not 100 years ago, right now. This is the Naval Administration. Did we lose, wait? You still there? Yeah, Can you I'm hear me, still Wade? here. I'm okay. still here, but I don't know what happened with the camera. I'm trying to check it. Okay. Here we go. You hmm. can hear me? You loud and clear. Okay, let's go on and, uh, and I'll figure out what's happening. Okay, the camera, yeah. so the bottom line is this is a building. It was planned in 1968. It was, uh, uh, I, see, uh, I see your camera again. And it was um, built. It is shaped exactly like what it looks like. And it is in uh, on a naval base uh. in uh, Coronado in California. Um, it is a swastika. Um, I don't know, your thoughts on the United States right now, um, and for many decades now, having a, um, I'm seeing, uh, we're seeing your, can you, can you hear me? We're seeing your camera. Oh, you're going again. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. I'm going to change the setting on the camera somehow. Okay. Go ahead. I'll give our. Yeah. yeah, continue talking. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Okay, I'll give our guests uh, just uh, this is something that I've been showing people because a lot of Americans don't know it. A lot of Americans don't know it's there. And that is a base. If you look at the article, um, uh, it came, the Google Earth was taking a bunch of pictures and uh, people looked at it and noticed it. Um, this is at the uh, the uh, barracks at a naval base on Coronado and San Diego. It was designed in 1967 by architect John Mock, uh, four structures, L-shaped buildings, um, and they basically, okay, so there we go. I see you back now. So there we go. This is, this is it. This is the United States Navy. This is a building that the United States Navy um, put up and maintains to this very day that's talk about saying the quiet part out loud. What's your, what are your, I've been asking my guest recently, what are your thoughts on seeing a stinking swastika? Although from the looks of the Biden administration and their allies, Netanyahu, it's pretty, and what's going on in Ukraine, it's pretty damn appropriate, but your thoughts on that, Lee? Oh yeah, look, uh, obviously at the end of World War II, the uh, West absorbed much of the Nazi uh, elite, including all their military elite. Everybody knows, you know, how the leadership of the Nazi military ended up leading NATO, leading NASA, leading much more within the, uh, and including leading Germany after the end of the war. So, uh, you know, this, it is not a surprise to see that uh, in the United States you have these buildings, and it's a story that a lot of us know about. Um, uh, you know, this picture of, of the building in the United States uh, Navy that looks like a swastika. And there's many other buildings across the West that are like that. Uh, I think the historically, uh, us outside the, the, the European sphere uh, understand that there was really no. Uh, Nobody that was disagreed with the Nazis in the West uh, during war, before World War II. What made the disagreement is that the Nazis used the same tactics that the West had used on the rest of humanity for centuries uh, against members of the uh, European uh, groups. And uh, that's the only thing that actually the United States didn't, in my mind, the United States didn't enter World War II uh, until it was worried that uh, England was going to be gobbled up by the Germans. Uh, otherwise, it was fine for the United States if the Germans occupied all of the rest of Europe or killed the Russian Slavic resistance to, to uh, capitalism at the time. So, uh, you know, to see now uh, and remember, like World War One, and the, the, after World War One, the walking away of Germany and uh, Japan and Italy out of the League of Nations 
was because they saw France and the UK and the United States continuing colonization, but the uh, League of Nations was not allowing them to occupy Italy and uh, Angola and Ethiopia and do the same as the French and the British are doing in terms of genociding locals and, and, and stealing resources. That's the reason that we had those states walk out of the League of Nations and ended up in World War II. Today, we see the United States acting in the same way uh, with it, all its vessels in the, in the West, where they're walking away of international law and the, all the treaties that they signed uh, and uh, of the United Nations uh, you know, charter and, and, and structures and destroying all of that because they're, they're disagreeing that they have to stop colonial behavior. Uh, and they're saying no. We we will continue to do this. And if you can't stop, if you don't like it, try to stop us. This is really what the war in Gaza is about, or the war on on uh, on on Yemen is about. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on next to uh, you know, let's move on to something to, to something. I did want to touch base on that since we were held up a little bit anyway, and get your thoughts on it. Um, Iran retaliation. Um, the uh, Israelis, you know, violated it as always. They could care less about international law and international norms, etc. They attack a, an embassy, and the Iranians say we will respond. But here's the part I think that the West doesn't hear: at a time and place of our choosing, the West automatically seems to think the Western mentality is: you punched me, I must immediately punch you back. It has been my experience watching the Iranians that they're slow to move, that they're careful, that they think of things through, that um, there's no guarantee when or how they'll respond, that it'll be today or tomorrow or next week or next month, that it won't be a number of things, not, not, such as giving more heavy, wep heavy weaponry to some of their allies and different things like that. I don't think it'll be just they come back and throw a punch. Not that they're not going to respond, but I don't think the West understands the concept of civilizations that have been around for tens of thousands of years, that the civilizations that have been around long see the long game and they don't have to punch a back, a back and that it will be a measured and a multi-pronged response. That's what I think. And, and, and I'll say the other thing. If you know I'm going to punch you and you have your guards up, why would I punch you right now? I'll wait. I could I could always wait until you get comfortable and say, well, I guess he's not going to punch me and put your guards down and then I'll punch you. I'm just I don't know if they haven't before this video, they haven't responded. But I just suspect that the Iranians are going to be intellectual in how they uh, craft their what I think will be a multi pronged response to Israel. Your thoughts? Yes, I mean. Uh, obviously, we've seen always Iran uh, take advantage of such uh, attacks on it to draw out bigger plans and put into action uh, these plans and accelerate their their coming into fruition. And you know, and we can see, for instance, you know what's happening in Yemen or what's happening in Syria and Iraq and. Lebanon in terms of, and Palestine itself, in terms of how heavily armed and trained right now all these uh, axis of resistance components are, or how they uh, are self-sufficient and building their own um, uh, equipment and so on. Uh, that's one thing, but it's definitely that the response of Iran is coming very soon. It's not going to be long. Uh, but a few things that uh, obviously you mentioned, the part of the response is, of Iran is to get the, uh, all the Zionist establishment to stand on one leg, you know, in the corner, right, like waiting for their punishment. And that's what we saw. The Israelis closing over 40 somewhat embassies around the world and consulates and withdrawing all their staff and hiding everybody. Uh, that in itself is a huge, uh, you know, cost. Uh oh, we just lost you, Lath. We can't hear you. Um, do me a favor, uh, sign out and come back.
Okay, there we go. That happens for some reason. It may be because he's in Beirut. Um, it may possibly it could be because he's in Beirut, but occasionally we'll lose him. And when we do, he just signs out and signs back in. And I've actually had that with a few other people that are in various parts of the world. I've had it happen with um, Jody Brar also in England. Could be software, could be any number of um, any number of, uh, of reasons. But uh, we'll keep an eye out here and Lath should be back any second. Let me just send him. I'll send him a message. There we go. And I'll just say sign just to make sure. Back in. And it happens. And, you know, I'm not going to um, negate the possibility that there's miscreant activity going on with the intelligence community. I mean, when I look at the numbers right now, 429 people, that's a very low number. Um, in consideration of the normal numbers for this time of day. And I would suspect that uh, particularly when it comes to this instance, the ins instance of the occupied of occupied Palestine, that um, YouTube may not be real thrilled about what we're doing and they could have a hand in it. But when I say intelligence community and YouTube, eh, you know, we're talking about the same thing. So, um, but the bottom line is, um, I I'll chat on a little bit. Now audio is gone. Can everyone hear my audio okay? Can can people hear me? I guess I can hear. Is oh, everybody is, is is is? Can you guys hear me? Are you hearing me? I don't know. That's weird. Yes, your sound is good. Okay, there you go. Um, so at any rate, let's continue. I think what we're looking at here is the Iranians uh, taking their time. I think part of it is this. You know, if someone says, "I'm going to punch you." right? And you tense up, right? Well, you're tiring yourself out by tensing up. How long can you stand there like this on edge? You know, you're, the, 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 the thing to do if someone's going to attack you is to relax, to breathe. So you can think you get plenty of oxygen to your brain, oxygen to your cells. And if you tense up, you're burning up all of your energy, tensing up your muscles, right? So what uh, the Iranians have done is they've cre created a, uh, an instance where the Israels are all, Israels are all tensed up and they're burning up their uh, give me a five count. One, two, three. Four, ah, five. there we go. Okay, so let's continue. We were talking about the uh, Iranians' response, I believe, and 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 uh, go ahead. Yeah, so so definitely the Iranian response is coming. Uh, it's going to be at their hands, as we heard uh, Iranian officials say, as we heard uh, you know Hassan Nasrallah of 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 Hezbollah saying, and uh, it's coming soon. Uh, it's going to be huge. It's going to shake the whole Zionist uh, establishment. It's not going to be a little joke response. And uh, we don't know what the targets are, but I think it's very likely that it will be inside the Zionist colony. It's not going to be an attack on their one of their embassies because Iran took a clear position that the attack on an embassy is a violation of the Vienna Convention, and they don't want to look like the ones violating the law. They're, they're uh, responding on the territory of the Zionist colony because the attack on the embassy is an attack on Iranian uh, territory. That's what an embassy is, is the sovereign territory of that country. Uh, the, we heard that the United States uh, contacted uh, Iran. They were saying, uh, please keep us out of it, <laughs> that we're not involved in this. And the Iranians responded by saying, well, you stay out of it too, basically. And it's that's, that is coming, the response. And that the, so what we know that is the United States now uh, de facto gave the permission for Iran to attack Israel and have acknowledged that what Israel did is a violation of the Vienna Convention and that uh, that gives the right to Iran to retaliate and uh, you know self-defense. So uh, I think Israel uh, right now is uh, all waiting for this response from Iran. And the whole region, according to what Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah said in his speech, he and this is the first time I ever hear him say such a thing. He uh, asked everybody to prepare their emergency plans. And, you know, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah does not usually, uh, you know, scare people or instill panic in people. He does not want to do that. 
but he said, depending on how the Israelis respond to Iran's response, and depending on how Iran responds to that response, we could see ourselves in a wide war across the whole region. This is all uncalculated, and it will all depend on how crazy the Zionists are, and given that they have been uh, performing in lunatic ways over the last six months, it's very likely that they will do a lunatic thing and in response to Iran's attack. Uh, and tomorrow, by the way, is the Eid, uh, at the end of Ramadan, a feast. Probably all of this came to, uh, uh, and, and yesterday was the seven days since the assassination of, uh, uh, sorry, since the, yeah, the attacks in, in Damascus and so on. So it's, there's um, religious usually commemorations after seven days of somebody's death. So we're, all of those, are factors in why Iran didn't respond yet. Uh, but I don't think people should uh, expect it to be uh, you know, very far away from coming. It's, it's coming now. And you know what we're looking at now, the reality is this. A broader war means destruction of the Western economy. I mean, a broader war means, regardless of what happens to oil infrastructure, um, if it is or isn't damaged, it means an interruption of oil supply, and it means the potential of interruption, even if it didn't interrupt it, the potential for interruption of oil supply would send prices through the roof, would send inflation through the roof, and that's it for the U.S. economy. That's it for the Biden administration at that point. That's it for them. I mean, I don't see that they got a snowball's chance in hell right now of winning, but if they have a snowball's chance in hell of winning, that would go out the window with you know eight dollars a gallon gas. So it looks like not only are we looking at the it, 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 I'll put it to you like this: it looks like the Israelis laid a trap in a way, right? And the trap is if we do this and Iran hits us, the trap is for the U.S. because then we expect the U.S. to come in. The trap is also if this does that the, if, if, and Iran hits us and then this thing spreads. The U.S. is caught in the trap because the U.S. economy crashes, the, you know, the European economy crashes, et cetera. That's the interesting part about the conflict when it comes to oil and natural resources. And might I add, even since Qatar provides so much gas, um, so much gas is coming out of Qatar that has to go through the Straits of Hormuz. We're looking at the potential I mean, immediate destruction of the Western economy, which is not very healthy right now. They can't take much of a hit. And this would be a baseball bat to the head. Your thoughts? Oh, yeah. I mean, the whole West uh, economy has been uh, stretched to its max uh, for because of the war in Ukraine, because of Corona and the response of the West to Corona. And uh, now with this war in uh, Palestine and the ramifications for shipping already that we see. So uh, it, it, it is clear that, uh, you know, Israel did what it did by attacking the Iranian uh, consulate uh, premises in uh, Damascus was a desperate act because uh, it's losing the war in Palestine and Gaza is lost the war also against the resistance in Lebanon. Uh, I think uh, our viewers it's lost the war in Ukraine. Yes, <laughs> That's lost. yes, yes, yes. So, so the only thing that it can think about, uh, and, and if there is a look, Netanyahu and his cabal know that if there's a ceasefire right now, there'll be a civil war inside Israel, and or the least of it, they will be rounded up and put in jail because of their failures in October 7th when they were in government and their failures since militarily, just because of the viciousness of the other Zionists, not because you know, the other Zionists think that they should be put in jail for the genocide that they committed, no, but because of their failures to defeat their opponent. This is why Netanyahu and Smoltrich and uh, Ben Gevere came into power. They said, we are fascist, openly they were saying that. And we will, with our fascist behavior, teach those goddamn sand ends uh, not to ever lift, lift their head, okay? With our, like, uh, punching in the, in the face that we will do. And what have they achieved? On the contrary, they have humiliated Israel militarily. 
They have stripped Israel of uh, you know 75 years of propaganda illusion that they are undefeatable. Um, and they have defeated the whole West with them <laughs> and destroyed all the media empires of the West. All of the media in the West, this is something very drastic, okay? All the media in the West ha have been uh, sacrificed for Israel. This is the lunacy of the Western elite right now. There's, there's not one media in the West that has now respect anywhere in the world. It used to be that uh, BBC Arabic or Radio Monte Carlo, he, you know, being broadcasted from Europe into this region, had more listeners than than the local stations. Okay, there's no more, <laughs> no more. Nobody will be listening to anything. It's it's the West sacrificed all of this. Anyways, Ben Gavir and his freaks. And Netanyahu and the freaks with them destroyed Israel. In a case of a ceasefire, they will be gone. Their political, uh, you know, uh, careers are gone. This is why they will maintain uh, this war through any means possible. And one of those means is dragging the region into a bigger war. Uh, the great thing for the Palestinians and uh, people of the region is that the bigger this war, the faster the end of the Zionist colony will be. And uh, I, I tell you, uh, even if there was a ceasefire, it's already the end of the Zionist colony. It would have taken maybe a year or two through negotiations and the pressures coming from the rest of the world for them to dismantle the apartheid state, like happened in uh, South Africa. That would, could have been the, the only possible peaceful <clears throat> way forward. But what Netanyahu wants is a is an us or them situation, and I don't know how far the West will go uh, to defend Israel as it becomes militarily clear that they will be defeated uh, once this regional battle is uh, launched. And the other question is, how far can the leaders in the region that are inured to inured to the U.S. empire, how long can they hold on? Because the other side of it is we see um, uh, Erdogan start to crumble. He's starting to fall. I mean, not fall, but he's starting to having no choice. I mean, he got wiped out electorally, right? As the pressure builds, and I think it's critical, as the pressure builds in Jordan, as the pressure builds in the Gulf states, etc., the U.S. empire, if it loses its leaders in the Gulf state, if it loses the leaders that it controls, it has nothing. In the, and, and, and I think that's the one of the horrifying things to them, that they feel like, you know, who knows, you know, whether it's the Epstein videos or whatever the case may be, they have a bunch of them, um, you know, under their thumb. But that's the other part. If they start to fall either the people overthrow the governments or the governments just simply say to the U.S. empire, they're going to they're going to cut my head off if I don't make a U-turn. I've got to make a U-turn. That's, you know, whichever goes first, that's going to be the end of the U.S. empire in the region if it loses its compradors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Already we could see even imagine Bahrain, which is, you know, has hosts the biggest American Navy base outside the U.S., um, and has been the elite have been oppressing uh, the population of Bahrain for decades. Uh, the majority Shia, the ruling family being Sunni, imported from what is now Saudi Arabia to rule over the Bahraini people uh, before the British withdrawal from from Bahrain in the 1960s. Uh, so. Uh, imagine in Bahrain uh, today, the Amir, the prince announced a uh, amnesty and uh, forgiving of thousands of prisoners, mostly that are political prisoners that have been opposing the royal family and leading demonstrations in support of Palestine and what have you. So that shows you that uh, Bahrain itself is scared. We're at a, a moment where the, the, this uh, whole region uh, could blow up in flames uh, depending on how Israel responds to the Iranians. We know the Iranians are, are, are going to attack. 
We just don't know how the Israelis are going to take this uh, punch, and we don't know where that's going to take us after. Okay. So a, a lot of these uh, countries are now scared because their whole existence depends on the American presence here, depends on their alliance with the Zionists for the last 80 years. They all collaborated with the Zionists since the 1940s and some of them since the 1930s. Uh, and uh, they, they, they all don't, can't protect themselves. They only have existed as elite that, that siphon off uh, a little bit of the money that the U.S. is stealing from the oil fields here. Uh, without that, uh, the, they, they don't even have people that are willing to die for them. They have to pay, uh, United Arab Emirates has to pay for Indian uh, police force uh, in the streets. Uh, Bahrain needs uh, Saudi military on the streets of Bahrain. Um, anyway, so yes, things are very fragile. And we are right now, it, with the liberation of Palestine, having uh, to open up uh, all the uh, wounds of World War I and what came after it uh, in the capture of these Arabic lands and the chopping it up into these fake countries and hopefully uh, whatever comes next will be the end of this uh, colonial era. Let me ask you this, your thoughts on Iraq. You know, when you mention um, you know, countries that were, you know, arbitrarily drawn up by the British and, you know, and they're, you know, with no uh, concern for ancient tribal lands and tribal boundaries. I think of Iraq with the Kurds and the Sunni and the Shia, the, you know, the, the, what, what they had for a long time was minority rule and, and, and the instability in Iraq from the U.S. empire still trying to um, basically occupy Iraq. And the Iraqis saying, um, you know, we don't like that. What do you see for the future of Iraq and the present of Iraq? What are your thoughts on it? It's a very interesting, particularly since the U.S., you know, bashed it to pieces and tried to occupy it afterwards. What are your thoughts on Iraq? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, for Iraq, for Syria, for Jordan, for Palestine, for Lebanon, these countries cannot exist as functioning states within those boundaries that were drawn in uh, World War I. And those boundaries were drawn on purpose to make them ungovernable, all of these states, uh, and, and except through brute force. And, and so when you have a country uh, like Iraq uh, that uh, you know, includes so many different uh, uh, religious sects and or uh, cultural groups, uh, it becomes harder to govern. There's no uniformity and so on in position. There's also, you know, m m many uh, hats that you have to appease and so on. It's not one, uh, you know, let's say one sect and you look at what the church, this church or that mosque wants and how you can work with them as a state. Now you're having like multiple. Uh, so. The only way that Iraq uh, can be uh, stable is for it to be conglomerated with this natural geographic extension, uh, this Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine. Uh, this is the part of the Fertile Crescent, and the rest is the Nile Valley. Uh, and 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 this, these, you know, then we will have a more homogeneous population in terms of uh, what is the uh, uh, how, many, how, how each sect's numbers and how much they affect a political reality and and so forth and it will become easier to move in a space like that where people have more freedom more until oh darn it we lost you Yeah, we lost Lathe again. Okay, we're gonna have to. Yeah, well, we'll we we still got more to say, so we'll see if we can get Lathe to sign out. Can you hear me? Hello. 
Ah, there we go. Okay, we're looking good. Loud and clear. Okay, yeah, continue. I just Mr. changed Rob. the mic. I don't know what's happening with live stream, uh, sorry, StreamYard and these uh, technologies of DJI. Oh, there you go. You just gone again. Hello? Yep, you're loud and clear. Who knows? Maybe we've got some help somewhere who's <laughs> doing Hello? Yes, you're loud. I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, you can Definitely. hear me now. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right. So, so, uh, what were we saying? We were talking about um... Iraq. Oh yes, Iraq. So my family, you know, the Maruf family, we are part of the Buhani uh, the, uh, clan, which is part of the Mashahda tribe. Okay, which means you know the Maruf family is originally from a region in Iraq called Ana, and they're part of the Mashahda. Uh, tribe, Mashahda are the ones that witnessed the assassination and martyrdom of Hussein. So my family is originally from Iraq, and so they, they've moved up the river in the Euphrates to where Deir Ezzor is hundreds of years ago. And this is what it was. You know, there's part of our family on the Iraqi side, there's part of our family on the Syrian side. Uh, and, and only these Sykes-Pico borders stopped us from continuing this relationship with our original towns and, and villages uh, and, and connectivity to our, our tribes and clans. So this is the future. The future, the minute the Palestine is liberated, is not the creation of a secular democratic state in Palestine for all those people, which is great. No, it's the integration of Palestine with uh, the, the natural region that it belongs to and a return of natural movement of people in, these, in this region. And uh, that will be a building block for Arab unity as a whole. Uh, the minute that uh, greater Syria is, is, is unified, then that opens the door for unification with the Arabian Peninsula, with Egypt and and then things start rolling and the United States is gonna this is why the United States is accelerating its uh, direction direction towards war global war with China and Russia because it sees the rest of the world conglomerating into bigger bodies that will be harder to manipulate so we see what's happening in Latin America the integration the between you know Venezuela, Colombia, Bolivia, Cuba, so on. What we, you know, Mexico, the integration that's happening in the Sahel region between you know Mali, uh, Niger, Burkina Faso. This is what scares the U.S. This it scares the U.S. and all of the European old colonial powers that uh, ex-colonized people finally and wipe away the colonial unnatural borders that were imposed on them at the end of World War I. Uh, and, and the battle in Palestine is it, the central battle for, for that ch change. Yemen, yeah, I understand there's been more naval battles. What are your thoughts? And I suspect, I do suspect that the Iranians will take some of the gloves off in Yemen, and I suspect that they're going to. I've already heard things about the Yemen having more Yemen um, uh, uh, Ansar Allah having more sophisticated weaponry. Your thoughts on what's happening in Yemen? Give us an update. Yeah, the Yemeni uh, forces announced that they will be increasing their attacks uh, and their uh, you know power, firepower in during the Eid. That actually it will not be. A, uh, a time of uh, secession of hostilities. And f they, they reminded everybody that it's been now eight years that the Yemenis had to live Eid every year under bombardment from the Saudi Emirati American coalition and that uh, they will be increasing uh, their attacks on the Israeli alliance uh, as a Eid gift for the Palestinians and for their own people. Um, and uh, they also announced that yesterday, last night, uh, they engaged in uh, a naval battle with American and British, uh, you know, naval pieces. They didn't uh, identify what, uh, what's these, the names of these ships or their designation. Uh, it's most probably their frigates. 
uh, that are the first line of defense of uh, the uh, aircraft carrier group, um, and that this battle lasted hours, uh, and that they had achieved their goals, and that their uh, forces returned to their naval bases unharmed. And this is the second time we hear uh, them uh, an announcement of such uh, a naval battle in the Red Sea in a week. So this shows you that uh, the United States is under uh, immense pressure. Uh, the, we already saw the, the, the Dutch withdraw their naval force from the Red Sea and fire their Minister of Defense because one of their frigates got, uh, their destroyers, sorry, got dam this damaged. They're claiming by itself uh, misfire, <laughs> missile, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, uh, Ansarullah were able to hit them, and this is the result. So the United States is at the edge now uh, of losing of, uh, some of its naval pieces in the Red Sea if this continues. And that's why we saw Biden begging Yemen, saying, oh, it will take you off the... Uh, terrorism list if you stop this and the Yemeni is laughing of course and saying no we will continue this until you stop the genocide in Gaza I also think that that is a critical um, Yemen is a critical shall we use the term chess piece I guess to uh, uh, steal a, a term from the imperialists it's a critical because as it sits the US is looking saying we know they have probably got much much more powerful weaponry that they're not letting us see and that should the u.s decide okay we're going to attack hezbollah iran wherever that they're uh they've got a number of ships in the red sea area and should yemen in fact have significant more significantly more powerful um weaponry which undoubtedly i'm sure they do if the u.s was to say okay we're going after hezbollah iran, whatever the likelihood is that the ships that they have now, I'll put it to you like this. Yemen's kind of playing footsie with them right now, throwing a few this, throwing a three, few that, keeping them busy, punching at them, swinging at them, you know, yeah, got them ducking and dodging. But it's obvious they're not really trying to sink these ships, I think. And that if this, a broader war in the U.S. were to become, a, a, you know, an open co-belligerent here, that they'd likely you lose they'd be in a bad situation there because yemen could put a hurt on them in a in a in a hurry and again the power of the resistance is they're looking at the iraqis and the iraqis keep sending missiles into, into israel so israel have to say it has to say do the iraqis have a thousand of those missiles you know if this were to if this were to happen and they'll hit you know an oil refinery or a base or a port and they have to ask themselves, could the Iraqis wipe out our board port? You know, could, how hard could they hit us if this happened? How hard could the um, Yemen hit the U.S.? It's kind of like someone standing there and I got my hand behind my back. They don't know if oh, I've yeah. got a knife, if I've got a gun, if I've got an empty hand. And that keeps me like, do I want to push this thing too far? Because it could be a gun, it could be a knife, it could be a grenade. I don't know. Your thoughts on all of that? Oh yeah, yeah, Iraq yesterday hit uh, Ilat, uh, the naval base in Ilat in the south of Palestine on the on the um, Aqaba Gulf. They also hit the um, main command control uh, base in Beersheba in the Naqab Desert, and they hit uh, the Golan Heights all in one day. The Yemenis, uh, and this is something that you know, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah in his speech on on Friday talked about Yemen specifically, and you know he said, oh, some some analysts are saying, oh, Yemen back down, there's less uh, attacks every day happening on ships, but if you look at it really, uh, the reason there is less attacks on ships, uh, trade ships that are passing through the uh, Bab al-Mandib is because there's less ships right. uh, daring <laughs> Yemen. That the majority of companies in the world, shipping companies already are going through Africa. They're not even trying. So if there's only one or two crazy American, British ships that are paid by the American government saying, go, 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 and we'll have your back with our Navy, uh, of, of course there's going to be less attacks and they are still being hit 
I mean, uh, just uh, two days ago, there was five different ships uh, that were hit. And uh, this, this shows you, of course, that Yemen has achieved already its goal. It has cut off the Zionists and the Americans and the British because of the Americans and British attacking Yemen from all, all, all shipping through the Red Sea. Done. It, with the least cost to it. Uh, and right now, uh, if the United States continues in this manner, uh, Iraq, you know, Yemen is going to uh, actually increase its attack on the naval forces uh, around its waters. And we are seeing that already now in the last week. Uh, they're just uh, kind of playing fussy, as you said, uh, to show that it, it could happen. Okay? The, because... Darn it, we, we lost you. Okay, I think I'm hearing you. Say something. No. Oh, uh, it shows that he's muted. That's interesting. It shows that he's mute. My thing shows that K that he is muted. Hello? Ah, there Hello? we go. It showed that you were muted for some reason. Now, now you're fine. Yeah, it had a little thing up that showed that you were muted. Give me a talk. Okay. Uh, say something. Well, now you can hear me. You're loud I'm, and clear. I'm, yeah, well, just now it showed that you were muted. I'm never gonna use this mic again for this okay. Uh, job. <laughs> okay, so continue. Um, you were talking about Yemen. Yeah. So, so you know, uh, Yemen will be attacking American forces directly if this war continues and it, uh, but if, if their objective is to get the Americans out, they're almost at achieved that objective right now from the waters with the least, all they have to do is continue to play footsie and eventually the Americans are gonna leave. It's costing them billions of dollars to maintain this presence. We, we, I, I was reading reports from the American Navy they're freaking out about how much it's costing them for this presence to, uh, you know, defeat the Ansar Allah. It's, it's uh, unbelievable costs, and uh, they can't maintain it uh, any longer. And uh, Yemen doesn't have to go crazier in their attacks to achieve their goal. They just have to wait a little bit longer. And so I think the Yemenis are very smart in their, uh, you know, designing their actions. Yeah, I think the tactic that we're seeing is of, of Yemen and the resistance overall. Again, I've got a book uh, 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 that talk. If some if people read this book, it's called "People's War, People's Army: The Viet Cong Insurrection Manual for Underdeveloped Countries." Right. And it's by the general who defeated the French in Vietnam. And he, when you read that book, I would, if, if, if people want to understand what the resistance is doing and how they do it, that book talks about how a resistance fighting against a gigantic, powerful imperialist army, such as the U.S., how they can be defeated. And when you read that book, it's basically it looks like the resistance has been, have been has been reading it you know what i mean it's they they're not going to get into a big pound for pound fight on them you know all of my soldiers line up against all of your soldiers no that's what they want we're not going to get in one place where you can just bomb everybody they're hitting them from they're creating basically as general Giap says the front is instead of having one front where everybody goes to the front like the big militaries and they fight along the contact line like you see in ukraine what general Giap says is the front is wherever your enemy is if he's over here that's the front if he's over there that's the front that you decide you engage him when you want to engage you disengage when you want to get engaged so that you control everything and that the weakness of the imperial powers is their size, is that they have to be everywhere and they have to d dominate. So you can punch them and leave and punch them and leave. And that's a great book to understand that. But it looks like 
right now, the U.S. has to say, well, let's say we engage and we're going to hit Hezbollah. Well, wait a minute. Iraq has missiles and we don't know they can hit our bases in Iraq and Syria. They can hit Israel. So even if even now it's not going to happen, even if we take out Hezbollah, we get hit over here. Even if we attack here, we get hit over there. Even if we attack here and here, now Yemen's going to pound us so that there is no respite. There's no way they can take nowhere they can take quarters safely in the Middle East. And their concern has to be if this thing blows up, they hit us from all areas at the same time. We, what are we going to bomb? you know every you know resistance faction we don't even know where they are so it's a, it's a lose lose situation for for a, a gigantic lumbering empire who's fighting small pockets of resistance everywhere look at israel in gaza you know yesterday they withdrew almost all their troops from gaza there yes. and they kept only one battalion around the Nazarim. Um, uh, crossing and, and this juncture that they wanted to build that separates North Gaza from South Gaza. I mean, the Israelis uh, had deployed 200 and something thousand of their regular fighters and have called in 300,000 reservists, so over a half a million fighters. And they were facing a, uh, a group uh, that has 25,000 maximum fighters. Uh, Hamas. Maybe you add another 10,000 for all the other Palestinian factions. And they are defeated. They were defeated. They won in October 7th and they're defeated in six months. They haven't been able to achieve one military strategic goal. Not one. And uh, even uh, if you count uh, every uh, adult male killed in Gaza as a fighter, and that's what the Israelis want to tell you, that every Palestinian man is a, is a, is a fighter of Gaza. Uh, even if you take their, their bullshit number, uh, 9,000, because of counting all the dead men, that's still, <laughs> you know, six months, and you only were able to kill 9,000 fighters, fighting age males. In reality, they, they probably only have uh, killed around uh, 1,000 or 2,000 fighters from the resistance since the beginning of this war. And that shows you how defeated they are because that is uh, a number you know, very close to what they announced as their own dead of soldiers. Um, and uh, they've lost the majority of their armaments close to 90% of their tanks, APCs, and so on, destroyed. Uh, huge price. And if this war continues, there will be no more no, you know, Israeli military period. Even just by facing Hamas, they, 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 they have like now tens of thousands of permanently disabled soldiers. Uh, uh, at least 40% of the soldiers wrote right now in the last few weeks that they will not return to service once they're disbanded ever they may leave the country even um, so how are they going to fight Hezbollah they're not they can't this is why they want to drag the whole West to fight the war on their behalf and I think they're gonna get it by the way and the other thing is they lost their economy with no hope of ever returning. There's no hope. When this is over, you will not be able to um, have anything that says made in Israel anywhere in the world because not only will people not buy it, they will protest against a supermarket that sells Israel stuff. Uh, people will have no parts of software. You know, they're very much into tech, their software. If it's from Israel, if it's anything from Israel. So they've lost their economy. Their soldiers uh, add this, and this isn't even taken into account. The entire generation of young men in Israel will be completely and totally traumatized from fighting, you know, look, fighting in the rubble. I don't care how brutal and vicious you are. It's going to traumatize you for life. You're getting shot at. People are getting killed. You're running for your life. You're not going to be able to sleep. You're going to suffer from depression. They will have mass suicides. You know, win, lose, or draw. If you've had the kind of fight that they're having and 
They won't be able to go to another country and say, I fought for the IDF in Gaza, or people will run them out of a restaurant. People will scream, oh my gosh, a bloody murderer. You know, they'll, they, they, they will be disgraced throughout the world. That's the other thing. Israel will have no economy and it will be disgraced for all time throughout the world. They have lost everything. And as far as I'm concerned, the only thing they're doing is digging the whole, their grave deeper and deeper right now. And they are digging a grave big enough for the United States to fall in it also. Yeah, I mean, the latest estimates is that they lost two thirds of their GDP and their production power since the beginning of this war, two thirds. Um, and, uh, you know, just they have at least like around uh, 800,000 left to the West and, and said, most of them saying they're never going to come back. Uh, but, but look, you know, the war in uh, up until now, uh, you know, the if you look at the territory of historical Palestine, Hezbollah managed to empty the north of Palestine. Uh, the Ansarullah and the Iraqis managed to empty the south of Palestine. And uh, the resistance in Gaza emptied the uh, envelope of Gaza from colonists. So right now all of the colonists are jammed on the coast uh, and the heart of Palestine. This is like you already have freed two thirds of the land without even one soldier entering uh, the ground of historical Palestine for the fight. Uh, and, and I think I'm going to, uh, you know, if you look at the economy of for, if, if Israel, right now the West is uh, writing these fake contracts with Israel, uh, specifically with Israeli military companies, to make a huge transfer of money. At this moment where Israeli military equipment is failing, uh, and nobody's buying, everybody that had orders canceled them from the rest of the world, like India and so on. They watched the Israeli military uh, equipment failing in, in, in Lebanon and failing in, in Gaza. Everybody's, uh, you know, not buying any Israeli equipment. But suddenly, and this is maybe it's going to help us segue into the ICJ, the court case of uh, Nicaragua versus Germany, for aiding and abating uh, the uh, war crimes and the commission of genocide through the sales of German weapons to Israel. Today, I was listening to the uh, German response uh, earlier in the, in the day to uh, the, the submissions of uh, Nicaragua yesterday, and the Germans were claiming that actually the majority of uh, sales or transfer of weapons happening from Germany to Israel is weapons Germany is sending to the Israelis for the Israelis to upgrade them and send them back to Germany. I mean, you, you, you'd have to be really stupid to believe that the Germans uh, suddenly need uh, $300 million worth of uh, upgrades on their equipment and only Israel can deliver on it just now, just after October 7th, because this is what the German uh, uh, sale of weapons. And so, and they're claiming everything that they're giving to uh, Israel, including these drones, are on loan. They're not sale, really. It's just a loan, and we have a say in what is happening with this drone, but don't blame us for the killing of the children uh, of Gaza by these drones. It, it, it was such a ridiculous situation, but this is what the U.S. is also doing. Suddenly, we're we're seeing supposedly everybody in the West buying. Uh, Canada claimed that it cut all sales of weapons to Israel, by the way, but at the same time saying no, no, no. Uh, but we're continuing to purchase weapons from Israel, and it's a huge increase in these purchases suddenly. So if you think about it. The only reason that they're doing it is it's a fake transfer of money from the West to Israel because the Israeli military technology is not uh, valuable at this moment. It's not worth this money. And if somebody who's saying will be buying from somebody else, not because of the genocide, but because of the performance of this equipment. And, uh, you know, hearing the Germans claim that. Uh, 
it's an upgrade. That's what there is. Well, the other part of it is that Israel won't be able to build it or anything else because they have no economy. All their people are um, fighting. And how are they going to get parts in? How are they going to get metal in? Um, they're in a world of trouble. The, um, the Yemen, the Ansar Allah has closed down their shipping ports. So how's Israel? They have no industry. They have no resources coming in that they can use to build or whatever. So they can't help anyone. It's obvious they're in a world of trouble. That being, that being said, let's hit the uh, last thing. Um, Nicaragua, a wonderful country, wonderful, outstanding country. Uh, um, they are um, now joining the international legal battle against, and they are going after Germany. Your thoughts on that case? I mean, I watched the whole presentation of Nicaragua yesterday. It was uh, heartwarming. It was amazing also. Uh, you know, just uh, like the case of South Africa against Israel, uh, if, you, if our viewers remember, the two parties uh, in the case can uh, nominate one extra judge on the panel. There's 15 judges. And then each of the uh, parties gets to pick another judge. Uh, it was uh, Nicaragua appointed a Jordanian Palestinian judge as their judge on this panel. <laughs> uh, so that tells you, of course, they could have picked a, a Nicaraguan judge and they have their, their worthy judges, but they chose that on purpose. Uh, and uh, then the presentation was uh, very clear. Germany uh, increased their sales of weapon after October 7 to the Israelis. 15 times, 15 folds, okay? So from 20 somewhat million to 300 and somewhat million dollars of weapons dumped on Israel just after the beginning of this war and after already all these UN agencies and all these organizations around the world were talking about genocide and purposeful targeting of civilians in, in the beginnings of October of last year, that uh, shows you an intent and all the statements of the uh, officials of Germany that specifically spoke about that the defense of Israel is a raison d'etat, meaning a reason of existence for the German state. This is what the president of Germany, the chancellor, the prime minister, the minister of defense, all of them repeated over and over and over that the reason for Germany's existence is the defense of Israel, uh, then that shows you that they have, uh, you know, purposefully supported this genocide. And uh, there was one of the, the, the lawyers of Nicaragua, he made a statement at the end of his presentation. He said, nobody, not Germany, not Israel, has a copyright on the term genocide especially given what is happening right now in Gaza. And this, is, this was a powerful uh, point. Uh, the Germans can't uh, pretend because they committed the, the Holocaust that they know m more than others of, on what is genocide. And, and the Israelis, or at least those who are descendants of the Holocaust, can't claim that they are alone can speak to what is a genocide. Yeah, uh, here, here. Well, Leif Maru, thank you very much. Once again, everybody, go to freepalestine.video. That's freepalestine.video. That's Leif's site. Um, they're doing great work there out of Beirut. They're doing uh, they're doing a lot of uh, reporting. They're trying to uh, make sure that they have English language reporting coming out of the heart of West Asia. So go to freepalestine.video. Make sure you donate, help keep them on the air. You can, um, for those of you, if you got a few pennies, if you got a few dollars, if you got a bunch of dollars, whatever you have, um, help freepalestine.video. If you don't, if you don't have a dime, You've got your social media um, accounts. So share freepalestine.video on your social media accounts and put on there, please donate. So people know to click on it and donate. You can make a difference. You may not have it, but other people certainly will. Um, additionally, uh, make sure you share this video on all your social media platforms. Thanks a lot, everybody. Sorry, we had a few issues here and there with um, sound, but we got it all worked out in the end. And of course, we'll be back next week.